It's so lovely to be here and be part of this and see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, so we've landed here again, and it's probably been about four and a half years since I was here last, and time flies. In May, it'll be five years since I was ordained. Um, and here, Trinity is celebrating the 64th anniversary. In human terms, Trinity should almost be ready to retire. <laughs> Hand in the towel. Just like so many other United Churches seen across the country. We have had a good run, but times change, people change, it's time to move on. And yet here you are, here we are, continuing to thrive. And I don't say that too loud because poor George Cuthbert will have a heart attack, our faithful treasurer, he'll think, oh, people think they'll start resting on their laurels and givings will drop. So rather than going in a way which uh, uh, to continue our, uh, to meet our financial needs of a busy church, let's just say we're afloat financially. But there it is really. Uh, it's important because we're rich in spirit. The church is used every day of the week. The word welcome is one in which you live. You have taken church beyond Sunday mornings. A wide range of folks from all backgrounds walk the halls of this church every week. Children have a place here. Perhaps not as many in church on Sunday mornings as you would like, but through Vacation Bible School, the theater groups, I'm assuming the scouts and girl guides continue to gather here. You can grumble that there aren't more children, or you can celebrate the ones who are here and know this is a safe place, and to be, to be and to know that you're welcomed here. When was the last time did you do a neighborhood campaign specifically telling your neighbors, if your child is in trouble and you aren't around, make sure that you know that if there's a car in the parking lot, they can bang on the door and someone will be there to help them. There's usually someone here during the day. We built that into our descriptions with our groups that use the space at the church in Tobermory during the day. If someone comes in distress, as part of our building, you're responsible also to be making sure that you're there to help them. There, we need to get back to some of our old basics and remind folks that our churches are a place of refuge, just like they always have been. This morning, John shared the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount, we can look at them as a little intimidating, perhaps impractical, an impossible challenge for ordinary living. Sometimes we think of them as outdated. But why they're important to me is that they are historical words, not handed down on slabs of stone tablets from this unknown source in the sky, but rather this regular guy, actually uh, this regular guy who we call Jesus. And we know that they seem to hit a nerve. Uh, and we're sti they're still relevant today. Charles James Cook writes that we can get bogged down with all of the Beatitudes or just look at them as a collection of the whole. There are basically three principles for living into the spirit of the Beatitudes. Simplicity, hopefulness, and compassion. Simply be a peaceful presence. Be a safe place. Open your heart to others. Show mercy on those who cry out for it. Hopefulness, which is the opposite of cynicism. It's so easy to become cynical in this world that sometimes we feel like it's spinning out of control. But that's not our call. Our call is to this guy this guy named Jesus. Our call is to stand in a place where life is all about possibility. We move forward in hope every day. When our feet touch the ground in the morning, we hope that they'll carry us. And if not, then we have a means that will carry us into our day and the resources and the people 
We hope that we can make a difference in the lives of others, that we can carry on our current ways of life until we no longer can. And the hope that our next opportunity will be waiting for us right around the corner to help fill up our lives and keep them meaningful. The key is being open to opportunities. Hope is about not lying down and waiting for death, death to come. I need water. It's actually gin. <laughs> the third principle is compassion. Not sympathy or pity, but real compassion. Henry Nouwen sums it up best by writing, compassion grows with the inner recognition that your neighbor shares your humanity with you. And that is the partnership that cuts through all of the walls, that which might have kept you separate across all the barriers of land and language, wealth and poverty, knowledge and ignorance. We are one created from the same dust subject to the same laws, and destined to the same end. Now, many of you here will remember Mildred Long, as uh, many referred to her as uh, Mother, uh, Mother Long, and well, and some other names I won't go into. <laughs> but if you didn't know her, she was a force to be reckoned with. She was about four feet tall, and she had these little beady eyes that could see right through you, and God help you if you were visiting. She would give you the once over. She'd be right there at the back of the church, making you sign the guest book and finding out exactly where you were from. But most importantly, once you were seen by Mildred Long, you know that you had been welcomed. Basically, she terrified me. My whole life as a young person, and later as an adult too, I would get invited to dinner at her place because uh, I was single and she always had international student boarders staying with her. And if you were new to Trinity, you could always count on an invite for dinner there. Basically, she kept her finger on the pulse of the comings and goings of the church and was always paying attention. And I used to think, maybe it's just nosiness. But realized, I later, later realized it was all about caring and listening. When I was about 26, Mildred called me up one day wanting, actually ordering me, to buy tickets for the upcoming men's chorus, who were going to be performing at Trinity. But at the end of the conversation, she said, what, what's going on with you? You haven't been in church. And I replied, I said, I'm, I'm just, I've been kind of down, I'm kind of struggling, personality stuff. But what Mildred heard was sexuality. And without missing a beat, she said, don't you worry, you are just as how God intended you to be. You are loved unconditionally. Now buy a ticket. <laughs> and I got off the phone, and I threw myself down on my bed, and I thought, holy Lord, I have just come out of the closet to Mildred Long. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I never forgot that. It stuck with me for the rest of my life. No hesitation. Just love you are exactly the way God intended you to be. You are loved unconditionally. Years later, Mildred and I were having a conversation, and I asked Mildred, what, what drives your faith? And the only way she could describe it was to say that every morning when she opened her eyes, she said, God, what can I do for you today? She recited the Beatitudes. <laughs> Simplicity, hopefulness, and compassion. What a lovely way to start the day. Now, I know that Trinity is in the process of looking at becoming an affirming congregation. You are having some of those tough discussions about what it means to really welcome all people, 
regardless of your sexual orientation, your gender identification, your lifestyle. And those are important discussions to have, but you also have to remember you're not starting from zero. As a young gay child, a man growing up here in this sacred place, I always felt safe. Took, I just took that for granted. I learned that I could live my life just being who I was, albeit odd and usually creating lots of mischief, being inappropriate, seeing the funny side of everything, making the McKinnell twins spit out their communion juice because <laughs> all over Jerry Hofstetter. <laughs> but feeling loved for who I was and unique in the eyes of God. Now, when my dear friend Nancy Horney, and many of you all know Nancy and, and uh, Don Horney, um, when I, they were here when I grew up, and when Nancy got married, the first thing her mother said when they came out of the church, she said, thank God she didn't marry Brad. <laughs> and then the next thing I heard, Carol McKinnell chimed in, and she said, well, how do you think we feel? We've got twins. We've got two chances of marrying Brad. <laughs> Growing up in Trinity taught me that I didn't have to hide who I was. I could just be. It also reminded me that my sexuality wasn't all of who I was. Again, I could just be. Sometimes I struggle with the whole affirming process only because if I had a, a young gay boy heading from Tobermory into Toronto to go to school, and if he was feeling unsafe, I want him to be able to go to any United Church, the first United Church he sees, and know that he can go there as a place of refuge. I don't want him to have to be looking specifically for an affirming congregation. We need to know that he's safe. The whole process of affirming congregations is a great way to encourage dialogue, have meaningful conversations, explore our roots at a deep level. But we need to remember, as the United Church of Canada, we are an inclusive community of faith, or we're supposed to be, and that's our call. It was only in 1992 that the first openly gay minister was ordained through the United Church of Canada. I wonder where would I be if that hadn't happened. Inclusivity is this little 64-year-old church that nurtured me along. The love of this church colored outside the lines. They accepted this goofy kid who in the 70s was from a broken home, and that was a big thing back then. I was this oddball, but it took me places that I never dreamed I would go. It opened doors for me because I was okay here. So I must be okay in the bigger world. It helped me to tear back the curtain so that the sun could come in and shine. It helped me to walk beyond the borders where I've never been before, throw open the doors to worlds outside the lines. Trinity has been my blessing in simplicity, hopefulness, and compassion. Amen. <laughs>